All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Kenny Coogan. I am the Education Director for the International Carnivorous Plant Society. And thank you so much for coming to an awesome monthly webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about growing Venus flytrap successfully and exploring the best cultivars with Jessica Povetta. And she is live here in the studio, which is also my dining room. Before Jessica starts, I wanted to remind you that if you go to our Facebook page, you will see upcoming events, including our virtual happy hours and our monthly webinars. The virtual happy hours are a place where you can bring a plant and a drink to your computer, and you can communicate with uh, carnivorous plant hobbyists from all over the world, and you can learn from them, and you can also share your knowledge with them. On Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023, will be our next World Carnivorous Plant Day. It is always the first Wednesday in May. And uh, it's a great day because every hour on the hour, we post a video from a grower or a uh, conservationist or a scientist from all over the world, and they share their love about carnivorous plants. You can go to our YouTube page which is International Carnivorous Plant Society. And you can see over 50 videos from the past two years. So that's a lot of great free content that you can watch there. Also on our YouTube page are five animated videos, which are perfect for beginners. You can also see some of these videos on the ICPS's Facebook page, but they Facebook does not like videos that are longer than one hour. So if you want to see the really big videos, you got to go to YouTube. Part of the uh, World's Carnivorous Plant Day is our annual photo contest. You do not need to be a member to participate. You just need to be following one of our social media pages. And the top three winners all receive a one-year membership to ICPS, which is a really great benefit. Part of World Carnivorous Plant Day, we also have really cool merchandise, like the shirt that I'm wearing right now with the Nepenthes by Calcarada. And all of that proceeds, all of the profits from the store go to either our education fund our, or our conservation fund. So you can buy a tote, you can buy a mug, you can buy t-shirts. Part of the education fund is providing carnivorous plants in the classroom. We have this grant period open every August, and we'll be announcing the winners in about a week. We were able to su successfully fund 20 classrooms from around the world this year. Last year, we were able to successfully fund 24 classrooms from around the world. And if you want to bring a little joy in the life of children, you can go to carnivorousplants.org slash donate, and you can donate money specifically for our carnivores in the classroom grant, which allows teachers to add carnivorous plants. And we all know that defining moments when we were in our childhood, when we first saw our very first Venus flytrap live or a pitcher plant live. So if you want to bring that excitement to kids all over the world, you can donate. If you also want to help the ICPS, you can go to icps.clubexpress.com and you can become a member. And there's lots of different ways you can become a member. Uh, there's lots of different levels. And I don't know if you can see me right now, but we have these really beautiful full color magazines. They come out four times a year. They include uh, cultivars, notes from the field, excellent articles. But the best thing about becoming an ICPS member is that you get access to the past 40 years of newsletters. So you have so much, uh, so many articles to read, you will become an expert very quickly. We also are being active on Instagram now, so you can follow us over there. We are trying to post one photo at least every day. And we are going to begin our presentation now. I do want to remind, thank you for everybody who's attending live. That means you're an ICPS member. 
I want to remind you, if you're attending live, uh, a benefit of that is you can type questions into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And at the very end, I will read them to Jessica and we will answer all of your questions between the two of us. I am so excited to introduce Jessica. I've known her for several years. She's the Florida flytrap queen. And I've gotten a lot of really great plants from Jessica. And I'm so happy that she was able to come here. We only live a few hours away. So without any more, take it away, Jessica. All right. Hi, everybody. I am Jessica. And today we're going to be talking about growing Venus flytraps and the best cultivars, some of my favorites. Um, when you're growing them, we're going to be talking about the lighting, the soil, the pot size, um, how much to water them, dormancy, feeding them, propagation, all that. And the cultivars, the good, the bad, and the non-working. All right, for light, I do have a few growing inside under um, 225 at YesComs, and I use the white ones. Um, I keep them about six to eight inches away from the light, and I keep the light on for about 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, mostly I grow outside though, to be honest in full sun. Um, they get about 10 hours. During the hot months, I do use a shade cloth because it gets extremely hot here in Florida. And <laughs> there's a picture of the sun. <laughs> here is um, a little comparison between inside and outside grown plants. These are the same exact cultivar, UK sawtooth. Here on the left is the plant that I grow inside under the lights. And on the right is the one that I grow outside. As you see, the pot size is a little bit different. So that could be why the outside grown ones are a little bit bigger. But I think overall, outside, you do get a little bit bigger traps than in lights. You do get a lot better color under lights, though. I will say that. Okay, when you're, when you first get them from like a big box store, you want to acclimate them to the sun because they will get sunburnt. They've usually been inside the box store for quite a long time in this plastic container. They don't get sun hardly at all because the big box stores place them in the wrong spots. And they're usually extremely light deprived. Now, if you get them from like a, a carnivorous plant grower, they're already acclimated a little bit to the sun, so they won't burn quite as bad. This is a little bit of sunburn here. You can see if your older traps start to die off and get sunburned, that's totally normal. You want to pay attention to the center growth, your new growth in the center. As long as that is okay and not starting to turn black, you're good. A little bit of sunburn isn't going to kill your plant. Okay, now the potting medium. I use peat moss and perlite mixture. I mix it about 60% perlite and 40% peat moss. I like to use a little bit more perlite because of the hurricane season. It gets extremely rainy and when it gets real wet like that, it tends to compact and get kind of nasty and I'm trying to avoid that. Um, I use a like a top layer of sphagnum moss. That way, when it rains real hard, it doesn't splash all the pure light out of the pots. I don't like that. And it also splashes peat onto the plants. And the little top layer of sphagnum usually stops that. You want to avoid anything that's miracle grow or anything else that has like additives or wetting agents, anything like that, because Usually they're extremely sensitive to fertilizers and additives and stuff like that. And you will get chemical burn on your plants sometimes. Okay, with pots, um, anything that's like terracotta, concrete, stuff like that can leach minerals. So you wanna kind of avoid that. I like to use just plastic pots. You can also use glazed terracotta, that's okay. 
Um, I like to use white pots because once again, it gets extremely hot here. So I'm trying to keep them a little bit cooler. Um, I use six inch pots and uh, about eight inches deep usually. But if you're using a smaller pot, that's, that's fine also. Okay, now the water. You can use reverse osmosis, distilled, or rainwater. All of those are fine. You wanna stay away from city water, usually unless it's under 50 PPOs. You can buy a, like a water tester from Amazon. They're pretty cheap and you test your water before you water them, that way you know for sure. I have built a little water tray here, like a table, and I've used a pond liner to collect the water. I usually, keep, it's about inch and a half, two inches deep. But smaller pots, you don't want it that deep. You just wanna keep it about a quarter of the pot deep. Here is my table, so you can see my setup. See how I got the pond liner right there. Okay, now for dormancy. If you have them outside, at least here in the South, they'll just go dormant naturally and you don't have to do anything normally. If, it, if you're worried about them not going dormant, you can use the refrigerator method and you want to take it out, clean all the, the dead off of the plant and spray it with a fungicide. You can just put a little bit of sphagnum moss in a Ziploc baggie with your plant in there and just throw them in the bottom little freezer section of your plant from about Thanksgiving to Valentine's Day. They should do good. If you're growing outside, like I said, um, and I don't really have a whole lot of experience with cold weather dormancy. So if it's freezing, you might want to put them in a garage or do the refrigerator method. I'm not sure how that works, honestly. But outside here in the South, at least, everything will just kind of die back a little bit. Your center and your new growth of your plant should still be alive, though. They will slow down growing quite a bit during dormancy. If not, they'll be totally inactive in some parts. Um, feeding them, most of the time they will catch their own prey. However, if you've got them growing inside or if you just want to feed them, you can. You can feed them pretty much any type of soft body bug. You can also rehydrate blood worms and feed them. It has little trigger hairs on the inside of the traps and you wanna make sure that you trigger those little hairs. So once you get the bug or the rehydrated blood worms or whatever you're using, you wanna kind of rub it in there quite a few times, three or four times, make sure you, like I said, hit those trigger hairs. The trap will close around the prey, but you also wanna massage the outside of the trap a little bit so that it simulates the bug is still in there and alive after it closes. Because if not, it'll open up and release whatever you have put in there. <laughs> now, for fertilizer. Some people do use maxi fertilizer. Um, you just want to mix it about one fourth teaspoon per gallon with distilled water and spray them about every two to four weeks. Okay, now we're going to talk about propagation. So the flytrap chromosome will divide on its own naturally over time. However, if you would like to take leaf pullings, you just take one like um, leaf petiole. Pe petiole of the, and you rip it off. You wanna make sure that you include a little bit of the white piece of the chromosome. You don't wanna just cut the petiole off at the green spot. You want to get that white piece because that is actually what regrows the plant. Um, you would just stick the white portion of the petiole into the pre-soaked sphagnum moss. And I put them out with my other mother plants in the direct sun or under lights, whichever one you prefer. 
Um, you can also propagate by seed. Um, what I do when I when they flower, I'll take and I'll rub a little paintbrush into the, the little pollen collectors here, mix it all together, just same way you would pollinate other plants. Usually takes about four weeks until the plants you are, should actually be able to see the seed a little bit. That's how you'll know when it is able to harvest. You take the seed and just spread it on top of pre-soaked sphagum or peat moss. Do not bury them. I haven't had much luck when you do that. So you just kind of want to sprinkle it on top and keep it watered the same way you would your other plants. And also the same amount of sun. You would put the seeds in the same amount of sun you would as the pollings or other plants. Now, as for disease and pests, I don't, I, I've used neem oil with success, but I don't use a whole bunch of other stuff. However, the International Carnivorous Plant Society does have a very nice hour long video by Damon here, and he talks all about pests, the diseases, funguses, cures, all that. I do battle mealybugs sometimes. And here's a little picture of that. Um, like I said, if I, if I can't combat the mealybugs with neem oil, I usually just pull the plant apart, to be honest, and take leaf pullings. Okay, now, now we're gonna talk about cultivars and some of my favorite ones. I enjoy typicals a lot. Anything that isn't registered is considered a typical. Or if you, lose, if you buy a plant that is registered and lose the tag and you can't tell the difference, it becomes a typical too. It's kind of tricky with all that. Here's a couple examples of just like Lowe's, Walmart style typicals that come from the big box stores. These are, I think, Rocket Farms from Lowe's, if I'm not mistaken. They're, they're actually very hardy. This is probably one of my favorite types. They're not fussy at all. They can handle almost anything. Here is a couple of like differences in typicals. As you see, this one over here is just solid green. This one has a nice red mouth and is actually quite large. I've bought both of these from Lowe's. I've also bought solid purple ones from Lowe's. Dentate type, because you can't say they're dentate from Lowe's also. Here is some of my favorite solid greens, ones with no red at all in the mouth of the traps. I love yellow. That's a very nice, vigorous cultivar. It doesn't get very large, like trap wise, but it gets a nice tight clump of plants almost always. Double green has a nice like um, variation of dark green and kind of light yellow here. It's very nice. I've only had it a little while though, so it's still kind of small, but very nice growing plant. Gremlin is also one that I love. This one actually gets decent sized traps for me. Probably my largest solid green would be Groom, but Gremlin is, is pretty close to it. Very nice, vigorous cultivar, as you see. Now we're going to talk about the purples and like the deep reds. Flytrap Store Maroon Monster is one of my favorites. It's a nice, large trap, and it's a very deep purple. Blood Red is another nice one. The, the mouth of this trap gets extremely red. However, the petrol stays green. It's a nice little color difference there. I really enjoyed that one. That was one of my first cultivars I ever got off eBay. Pink Venus is similar to Maroon Monster. However, it doesn't get quite as large, but it's pretty close. The AK Ryus, they um, are also kind of similar to Maroon Monster, but they are not as vigorous and they seem to struggle a little bit more. 
than the other two. These don't grow amazing, to be honest. They're just kind of there. Now spotted and variegated plants, some of my favorites. I absolutely love scarlatine. That is one of my, just, I, that's probably my favorite out of all of them, out of all of the fly traps I have, a hundred and something cultivars. Amazing, it's like deep, dark, blood red speckles on the outside and inside of the traps, even though this picture doesn't show it much there. The BZ57 white form is a very new plant for me. And as you see here, it has almost ghost white traps. It's absolutely amazing. Beautiful. Now we're going to talk about ones with texture. Crazy Craig's carnivorous plants prickly pickle is very nice. Texture wise, you got nice bumps down there on the petrol. Nice. I cannot say the name of this one, so forgive me. Stupor Snitzels. That one's also a really nice one. This one has extremely large traps for me. This is one of my pretty large cultivars, actually. I'm not sure if they're all like that or if it's my conditions that it's growing in, but it's lovely. Dragon's Breath is another new one that I recently got. And this one I'm really excited about because of the different colors. You got extremely red, deep red colors and bumps on this one. I'm really looking forward to this one as it gets larger. Now we're gonna talk about the different teeth on some of them. The dentes have like a, like a shark's tooth is what I like to call it. What's what I tell my kids. Very nice. Diabolic horns is more like werewolf type teeth. They're larger and more spaced out, kind of like claws almost to me. This is once again, my UK sawtooth. They have similar traps to Dente, but I would say they're a little bit different, uh, more darker red and a little bit more spaced out, I guess you could say. Bristletooth has a very nice, um, a lot smaller jagged edge than the, the UK sawtooth. I would say this is more like a serrated knife type style. These are the ones with almost no teeth at all. Giant microdente has very, very small teeth, as you can see. The same with the red. Almost nothing. Whale is also a very nice one with nice little serrated teeth, tiny little ones. Periscope is also one. Oh, thank you. Periscope is also one with hardly nothing at all teeth-wise very small. Craig's razor blade is also a very nice one. This one I love because the traps come in sort of green, but as they mature, they get more red. So that's cool. That's extremely cool to me. This one, I also can't say the name of this one. Lupo Shas, yeah. This one, <laughs> um, this one is really cool because this one has like almost like a jaw smiley alien type like bend to it. And it also has kind of fused tooth teeth, teeth almost. This is also a new one for me, but I'm loving this. I've heard that the traps get a real beautiful red to it also. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Green wizard and arch traps. These are a few like um, solid green ones. This one has, uh, I don't know, kind of curved in teeth. And arch traps is similar to archangel, but a tiny bit smaller and less prominent teeth. They also bend 
almost completely touching back once they grow out fully. It's really cool. All right, now we're going to talk about highly mutated. And some of these, to, <laughs> to be honest, they, they struggle in the direct sun for me. This is, this is the reason that I use a shade cloth most of the time, honestly. Mirror is really cool because it has almost like little butterfly wings back there. It's super neat. Freaky Star is also a cool mutated one. As you see, it has literally little tiny bristle tooths, itty bitty, but they do have trigger hairs and this one actually does eat. A lot of the highly mutated ones don't eat. But as you see, this one has a fly in it, pretty cool. Now we're gonna talk about Ramses and Galaxy. These are super cool. Ramses, we just got. We um, imported it, so that one is still kind of accumulating for both of us. Galaxy is a nice, it curves almost outside. It's very, very cool. They don't really catch prey. Sometimes um, during like the beginning when it's first coming out of dormancy, some of these highly mutated traps will throw a few regular traps also, and those regular traps do eat from me. But once they start throwing the, the mutated traps, they, they stop eating most of the time. Here's a few more werewolf type traps. This is werewolf itself. These have super cool, like I said, claw-like teeth. They're really neat. Very neat. Dambal is a really cool one because it it's almost like it doesn't have teeth, but the trap itself comes out and is mutated. Triton's pretty cool because it, it's got one side of the trap is fused. So it's almost like a catcher's mitt. And you also have like paintbrush style little teeth there. That's pretty cool to me also. I like that. Another one that I can't pronounce the name, kind of like cup traps here. This one, it struggles for me sometimes, I think because maybe it doesn't have traps at all. And you're probably supposed to use a little bit of fertilizer on ones like this, but I don't. Biohazard is another really cool cultivar. The Biohazard 2 does better for me than Biohazard 1. So start there. <laughs> the extra small ones. Okay, so if you have an extra small traps on your plant, you either have a small plant, young plant, or you probably have a light problem. Honestly, you're probably lacking light. You need to up the light a little bit if it's very small traps, especially if it's small traps compared to the period itself. Now we're gonna talk about some of my largest cultivars. B52 is a classic. One of the most common large cultivars. I've had it almost the whole five years I've been growing fly traps. Like I said, it was one of my very first ones that I bought. Red Pablo is also a really nice one. It's, it's a, like a purple, sawtooth type one, but the traps are extremely large, over an inch and a half usually for me all the time. G14 is very, very similar to B52. The traps do stay a little bit darker for me than the B52s. They wash out color a little bit in the heat, but G14 always stays a nice deep red like that. Groon is a solid green cultivar. It has no red on it at all, ever. And it gets nice, large, lovely traps. It also clumps up very nicely, divides very nicely on its own. It's a very nice cultivar. Archangel is one of my favorites. I love how large the, the traps are and how they kind of bend long ways, kind of. It's very cool. Big Tomato is a nice red trap that stays nice and dark like that all the time. For me, even during dormancy, this one has pretty large traps. 
DCXL is another classic that everyone pretty much sells or has. It's usually one of the first ones you buy when you want large traps. The world record, actually, Jeremiah holds the world record for largest one, and it's an alien, actually. My alien is actually really small, kind of hates me, so I would love to see my alien get the big two-inch traps like his had. The Guinness World Records. In conclusion, that is how you grow Venus fly traps, especially here in the South. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jessica. All right, that was wonderful. And look at all these people who came oh, to see us. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. So if you have questions, please type them in uh, the comment section and I will read them to Jessica. We have lots of questions. It was an awesome uh, webinar. So I've been growing carnivorous plants for like 17 years. Jessica, how long have you been growing Venus high chips? A little over five years. And. I had never taken a leaf pull of a Venus flytrap in like the first 12 years. And then I met Jessica and she said like, yeah, you just pull the leaf off and you stick it on top of sphagnum or pea moss. And I was like, okay, like I read about it, but, I'll, but I guess I'll do it. And then mm -hmm. I did it and every like 95% of them took yeah. and they turned into tiny little plants and I was amazed. That's probably the easiest way other than just natural, natural. And what else was really surprising was she was doing the leaf pullings in like full Florida sun. <laughs> and then I just started doing that too. And I had such good luck. I did tell Jessica that I had better luck doing it in a peat perlite mix rather than sphagnum. And I think it's probably because we're so, I don't know why. Maybe the leaf pulling, that little part of the rhizome needs more contact. Yeah, like than, it, it stays better in there. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions. One is, um, how many cultivars do you have, Jessica? Oh, I think I'm at a little over 150. Yeah, so she has- I'm not a, really sure, about 158. I'm at now, <laughs> not really sure. So at least no. 150 different cultivars. And when we were making this PowerPoint, we kind of decided to highlight the good ones, because there are a lot that, go ahead, Jessica, what happens? A lot are repeated. Unfortunately, you get a lot that look exactly the same with a different name, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. So when you do a leaf pull, what size pot would you put the leaf pull in? Hmm. I would actually use a smaller pot for leaf pullings because you want to make sure that it does not dry out. That is very important for fly traps, especially pullings, because if you hurt that new growth of that pulling, you're going to kill the whole thing. And if you get a little quarter size Venus fly trap, what size pot do you put that in? I would also put that in a small pot. I have not had good luck putting them in larger pots, but I think that's because they dry out a lot faster here than in most places. So you're having to give it constant water if it's in a big pot. And you mentioned that for the highly mutated Venus fly traps, you should probably fertilize them, but you personally don't. I don't. So how, like how big can you get them without fertilizing here in Florida in your conditions? Um, it depends on some of the cultivars, I would say. Some of the cup traps there don't do too good, honestly, for me here. Um, like I said before, anything that eats does amazing. But once you start getting into that, we don't do so good. So I do use the Maxi and yes, uh, Peter and Jane, the NPK ratio is 16, 16, 16, a quarter teaspoon per gallon. And, you know, you're just going to be spraying it foliarly. So you're going to have that container for a very long time. Um, where do you find all these? Where can people find all these rare cultivars? Now that they're excited, yes, they, they, they have... want to have a double green and they want to have one with giant teeth and they want to have a two inch wide one. 
they have a lot of good online stores. Um, so you can, because it's international, mm -hmm. they can Google Venus Fly Chat for sale in their country. Yes, in your country. And I know both Jessica and I have had a lot of luck with like social media, trading. Yes, trading with other hobbyists is probably my favorite thing as opposed to just buying random things. I love to trade and help other people out, especially with the more expensive ones. All right, Jane has a question. Can Venus fly traps with really small traps catch insects? Have you noticed yes. like little baby? Yes, all of my, even the first trap that comes out, they'll catch very small little ants gnats stuff like that they as soon as they have a functioning trap they will catch all right and then don and jane have a follow-up what about the ones without teeth like the whale and um... yes those do catch prey also as long as they have a trigger hair and they're able to properly close they will catch prey so you are both of us are in central florida but we're a couple we're like an hour and a half away from each other i have a lot of oak trees I grow my Venus fly traps not as successfully as Jessica, but I grow them outside with maybe like six hours of full Florida sun and there's a couple of oak trees. But what type of shade cloth do you, so your backyard is like full, full, yes, full sun. I have hardly no trees where I'm growing my fly traps at. Um, and to be honest, I don't know much about my shade cloth. I just typed in shade cloth on Amazon and bought the very first one because I was panicking. And how long is it up for? Um, about three to four months, July, August, September, usually, sometimes give or take a few weeks there. So uh, we had a question about what's your preferred soil mixture. And you said in the beginning, it's um, like peat and perlite with a top dressing of sphagnum also. The heavy, I don't know if you noticed, but halfway through this presentation, <laughs> It was a severe thunderstorm. The yeah, the got, bottom fell out. It got really <laughs> bad. <laughs> so in Florida, that top layer of sphagnum moss helps prevent the peat from kicking up and hitting the plants and getting them up. And then it doesn't wash all your peat completely out of your pots. Okay, so Jessica, you do have a few that you grow under grow lights just to experiment. Somebody has noticed that theirs get sunburnt under grow lights. Could this be the type of grow light you use? I would say probably. Yes, so you yes. use YesCom. I do. And I, I 220, usually, 225. 225. I use the and white ones. white. I don't have a problem, but that could be because I took my plants from outside in the full sun and put them under the grow lights. So you don't really need to acclimate them that much. I do when I take them back from under the lights and put them back into the sun, they do get a little bit sunburn when you're going from inside to out. All right, Peter has a question. Um, the plants which are grown outside seem to have longer and more narrow leaves. And this part is the petiole and that's the trap. So Jessica, why do you think that is that your outside plants have, do or do they have longer skinnier? They, they do, they do. And I think maybe it's because I keep the grow light so close kind of even in the sun, they're kind of reaching for the sun, as hard as this is to explain. They're well, they have really big root systems mm -hmm. because your pots are so tall. Yes. So the more stuff you have underneath, the more they can support on top. Yeah. So you just get massive. You also have certain cultivars that have extremely large petrels compared to traps, like King Henry. That is almost a saggy trap. The petrol is so <laughs> long and the trap is so big, it just kind of hangs over. It doesn't really stand up that much, so. All right, so you take a leaf pull. It will probably strike, which means it'll probably start getting roots. And then you have from the one leaf that dies back and then you get like a little circle of little baby. Yes, little baby You traps. get a little baby plant. And then uh, Chloe wants to know, how long does it take for that to, turn into like a full grown plant? Years, honestly, even, you know, if you're growing from seed, it takes a lot longer than pullings from me, but it takes me a good year to go from a pulling to a mature plant. And then to reach flowering stage is probably another year after mm -hmm. that, honestly. Yeah, so there's another question about how long do they, 
how long does it take for them to get mature? And then do they die when they flower? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I don't know if the aromasome itself actually dies. However, I have noticed that when they flower, what tends to happen is the aromasome will divide. So once it flowers, your original mother plant might die off, but you, it will come back with two plants as opposed to one. They won't be as big as the mother plant. And they do struggle sometimes when you let them flower and try to get seed from them. I have noticed that. All right, so we have a couple of people because we're international, we got people from all over the world. So if you're in a really cold environment, it's probably the best to bring the bulbs in just like a tulip in the winter. Yep, you want to mimic the Carolinas as best as possible. So if you're in a colder area, you're gonna have to protect them in the winter. If you're in a really subtropical location or tropical location, you're probably gonna have to protect them a little bit in the uh, summertime. And there is a full article from John, the vice president of ICPS about how you can skip dormancy. Some people argue with, some people don't believe it still, but he's been growing them successfully year round. And the secret is continually feeding them. Feed them a lot. And here, I've noticed that here, at least in Florida, my traps stay active even during dormancy here. Oh, so okay. mine continuously grow, honestly. And then Jessica mentioned a, a water meter. It's called Total Dissolve Solids. And then you just take this off, you stick it, and this costs not very much. That's but 10 bucks. On yeah, 10 to 15. I use this all the time. I, I check the water that I'm giving the plants. I check the trays that the plants are sitting in. And it has, like she said, it has to be 50 parts per million or less. All right. So we have like 40 questions. We have 40 comments, but not all of them. You know, a lot of them are, I want that plant yeah. or I love that plant. So, and a lot of people are just like, thank you for answering me. And um, yes. So if you have more questions, just keep typing them in here. Um, all right, very good. Oh, so your preferred method is to grow them in those big white pots. Do you have any growing in bulbs? Do you have any experience growing them like in a big container? I do, I, I would consider that honestly a pot also. Um, but yes, I, I grow them in everything, even like the giant Tupperware containers you get from like the dollar store. I'll poke some holes in that and I have quite a few typicals potted in and things like that. I'll use almost anything that's plastic for a pot. I don't know if it came through in the um, photos, but can you tell the people like, what are some of your sizes of your big plants? like trap size or the actual plant? Oh, I've, I've got one and a half inch traps easily from a lot of my cultivars. I, that aren't supposed to be big. Yeah, that aren't supp supposed <laughs> to be big. It's hard for me to get over that once it gets like 1.8, if you don't add fertilizer, it's probably about as much. Now, if you add fertilizer, things can get them down. Bump them up. You can hit that world record. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll, I guess we'll leave you on that note. Nice. We, we want to encourage you to try to grow them as healthy and big as possible. I don't know if you saw this, but if you become a member of ICPS, you get these beautiful uh, newsletters four times a year, tons of information. And I, you know, these are beautiful, high quality, full photos. But what I think is the real special thing is you get access to the last 40 years. So that's a great, that's a great reason to become a, Number. Yeah, there's also different cultivars and new cultivars and Better stuff like that. Registered. Nice in the book. It's yeah. really nice. Not only a fly traps either, but yes. all carnivores. All right? the carnivores. So we want to thank uh, everyone for coming. And we thoroughly appreciate you guys. Thank you, everyone. This will be up on YouTube in a couple of days. And next uh, Wednesday is our next happy hour. And we hope to see you all there. Bye, everyone. Bye.
The International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite. But our plants do.